that again. Because that, for me, and a lot of us, we fall under this. We have a shallow understanding, but we have good will. And to many African Americans, that's more frustrating than the complete misunderstanding from people of ill will. So if Micah 6.8 says that we are required to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God, what now do we owe the black man? Well, first of all, we owe a deeper understanding. But not only that, we owe deeper relationships. Not only deeper learning, but deeper listening. You see, there's a temptation that all of us have. Birds of a feather want to flock together. But if we are going to follow Jesus' example of all of us being one, then we need to flock somewhere else. We need to replace our ignorance, not just with learning, but more importantly, with listening. As I have come from Western Canada, although I have strong American roots, I grew up in Western Canada, I didn't have any African Americans around me. Zero. Caribbeans and Africans, yes. And I came here to Andrews University and was like, wow, what incredible diversity here. Knowing the, the negative history of segregated education, I was here, I was like, man, this is so cool. And this one time I was in the seminary down by the elevator. And I was talking with one of my African-American classmates and, and just talking with her about, about stuff. And the topic of progress had come up. And I shared how happy I was uh, about the progress we'd made even since MLK. In the process, I kind of asked her about her experience as an African-American. And she shared with me how blessed she was and her family for her father to be able to get an education. From there, he was able to get a better paying job, and they were able to move into a nicer neighborhood in the suburbs of New York. But when they moved, the nicer neighborhood wasn't very nice to them. Frequently, they were called the N-word. They were treated as if their very presence polluted the street on which they lived. This one time, as her and her little brothers and sisters, children, were walking home from school, someone who didn't care for their color pollution to their racial purity in the neighborhood sent their dogs after the children. The children's self-preservation scrambled on top of cars to get out of the reach of the canines. My generation, not MLK, my generation. As they climbed on top of the cars, people called the police. The police showed up and scolded the children for climbing on cars and did nothing with the people who sent the dogs after them. This week, this week, I'm listening to an African-American friend of mine, and he's sharing with me, he's younger than I am, how he worked for two years to save up enough money to buy a car. Finally, young man, ladled with testosterone, driving his own ride, goes into the white neighborhood, crosses over from the black neighborhood, equivalent to St. Joseph and Benton Harbor, He's in there for less than three minutes following all the traffic laws. Not only is he pulled over, he's spread eagle on the side of his car. And he knows there's only one reason why that's happening to him. Imagine the same young man, in the same period of his life when he was 16 years old, his father who's a diabetic, a hard-working, honest man, 270 pounds is driving, in, in, a, in a little sporty car, and his sugar levels are dropping, so he's starting to go into a diabetic coma, so he starts to swerve. His consciousness and his judgment is decreasing. He's starting to swerve. He's trying to get some place to, to, to get some medicine, to get some sugar. And, and as he's swerving, some white cops pull him over. This is not in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s. This is in the 90s, the middle 90s. The cops come over, smash his window, Somehow they pull a 270-pound man out of the car 
and they beat him to an inch of his life. That morning he woke up with all his teeth. That night in the hospital, he had none of his teeth. Not one of his teeth was left in his mouth. And I'm listening to this story this week, and I'm thinking there, how can you not hate me? I have no clue what that's like. Stuttering isn't the same. That doesn't cut it. And, and being made fun of because you're a seminarian, not the same ballpark. We have a shallow understanding. And then we wonder why African Americans want to have their own societies, their own seminary club, their own RV section over at the fair. We don't take the time to listen. We don't take the time to not only humbly walk with our God, but to humbly walk with our neighbor of a different race. See, truth be told, if you were to ask someone, how can I grow spiritually, they would say, read your Bible, spend time in prayer, spend time in solitude, attend church regularly. But history proves that you can do all those spiritual disciplines and still be a bigot and a racist. You can do all those spiritual disciplines and still not stand up for the Jews in the Holocaust, still actively support slavery in the land of the free. See, Jesus didn't just talk about these things. He actually did it. You look not just what Jesus says, look at where Jesus traveled. He didn't start his ministry in Jerusalem the Berrien Springs of the Holy Land, he started it in Capernaum, a poor fishing village. He didn't just hang out with, with his own type, the birds of a feather that flock together. He went and he visited the towns of Tyre and Sidon, very ethnically missed, mixed. When children were considered nothing, he would welcome them and pray with them. When tax collectors were, were shunned, he would go and have supper with them. He would even touch the lepers. I think the strongest case is in John chapter 4. When rabbis would not publicly talk to women, Jesus not only publicly talks to the woman at the well, he's not only a woman, but he publicly talks to a woman who is also a Samaritan. Now, not only is she a Samaritan woman, but she's at the well at a time when even the other Samaritan women wouldn't be there because she was of such ill repute. She was even ostracized from the other Samaritan women. And Jesus goes there and speaks to her. And that's why she's surprised and the disciples are surprised. It was perfectly natural for Jesus to routinely cross borders that others imagined impenetrable. See, Jesus crossed over the river, crossed over the race line, crossed over the cultural division, and took the time. This time he took two days to humbly walk with his Samaritan brothers and sisters. See, we need to move beyond just tolerating each other at a distance to celebrating each other up close. I remember... I went to this party once, Adventist party. I, mean, I was wild and brought some soda. I, I, I brought those things to the party, and I was greeted with a smile and a handshake at the door. I was welcome to play the, the different Adventist blessed games like Rook, because we know we don't play cards. I, I, I was able to come in there and hang out with everybody else, but there was just this feeling Although all the politically correct things were there, that I was being tolerated, not celebrated. That whether I was there or not didn't really matter. Now you know what it feels like to be a black man and cross over to St. Joe. Where you can have a PhD, be a distinguished gentleman with a salt and pepper beard, but if you are black, you will be followed in that store. While a young white punk can walk in there and no one blinks an eye. The truth is that we tolerate each other at a distance rather than celebrate each other up close. Imagine a stained glass window with only one stain. 
Imagine a piano with only one key, a guitar with only one string, an organ, heavens no, with only one pipe. Is that beautiful? No. That's boring. The truth is God made us different on purpose. It is our difference and diversity that creates beauty, not the sameness. But yet it's so easy to flock together with everybody else who looks and smells and talks and acts and thinks just like us. When I was in the Middle East, in Madaba, in the country of Jordan, there's this Byzantine church. As you walk in, you see this part is fenced off. You cannot go there. And as you look down, you see all these different tiles. And they're specifically placed so they make this beautiful mosaic of the Holy Land, including one of the most ancient maps of Jerusalem. What brings that beauty is not that all the tiles are the same, but that all the tiles are different and specifically placed by a master artist. In 1 Corinthians 12, 18, God describes the church that way. In fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. See, the beauty is in the differences and diversity working together. Birds of a feather flock together. Well, we should be like Jesus and flock somewhere else. Maybe some of you are going to be called to flock up to Benton Harbor. You don't even have to change your membership. Amen? But move out of your comfort zone. I've seen so many people are scared to even go into Benton Harbor in the broad daylight. Looking over their shoulders, I'm like, relax, man. I'm here all the time. It's okay. I wish I was joking. But maybe some of you are being called to flock somewhere else and come into Benton Harbor, not as a teacher, but as a learner, to listen, to connect with the community before you try and provide solutions. Maybe you're called to flock somewhere else out of your own comfort zone and experience the beauty of the difference and diversity that God has brought to his people. You see, we've done it with Europeans. I'm proud of my German background. That doesn't divide me from British people or Russians. I'm proud that my mom is Brazilian, but doesn't mean that I ostracize myself from Mexicans. I'm proud of who I am, but it doesn't divide me from the European divisions, although it used to a couple hundred years ago. So why can't we do that with color? Especially not just dark folks from the Caribbean or from Africa, but specifically with the African Americans, because they're the ones that we've wronged the most. You see, if we are going to not only walk humbly with our God, but also walk humbly with our neighbor, we need more than a proclamation. We need more than a civil rights act. We need more than a black history class, a black history month, or a black history sermon in the middle of the summer. We need to go out of our way to replace our subtle resentment with deep relationship. Eleanor Roosevelt said that when more whites and more blacks are friends, we shall have a much happier world. Well, I say when more whites and more blacks are friends, God's remnant church will be a much happier church. If birds of a feather do flock together, why don't we follow Jesus and flock somewhere else to go and not only walk humbly with God, but walk humbly with our neighbor of a different race, of a different color, of a different culture, from a different country. If we really want to raise little white boys and black boys who are truly free from the sins of the past, if we really want to raise little white girls and black girls and Hispanic girls and Asian girls who can truly play together and not notice anything more different about the color of their skin than we Europeans notice about the color of our hair or the color of our eyes, are we really ready to not only celebrate when we are the, vi the victor, 